I'd like to do is tell you a couple of things about, about me. Um, and it always takes me a couple of minutes at this conference particularly, and I do a lot of conferences, and I, I think you've all been to a lot of conferences, like the TED conference, that's familiar to you, right? These conferences, um, various sort of design conferences. I'll make reference to <clears throat> some of these events. They're, they're theatrical, they're kind of academic, um, they're comical in a certain way. Um, and, uh, and, and they're a very interesting way of transmitting information. But, but to come to a conference called Applied Brilliance, um, and to be a speaker, and to be the first speaker, <laughs> right after dinner. Um, I mean, I'm between you and the bar at a conference called Applied Brilliance. <laughs> it's a dangerous situation. It's a scary uh, situation to be in. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. Let's talk about brilliance, right? I mean, brilliance. Everybody knows brilliance, right? Isaac Newton there. Ugly son of a bitch. Whew. But he was brilliant. I mean, brilliance. Who's not for brilliance? I mean, everybody, everybody loves brilliance. You're going to be anti-brilliance? No, no, no. Brilliance is something to get behind. It's a little sibilant, brilliance, OK? Um, you know, <laughs> brilliance is, it could be controversial. Maybe it's brilliance. You know, maybe it's musical. But it's also sort of scientific. It's inside. We know what we're talking about when we talk about brilliance. But applied brilliance? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I mean, applied brilliance? Now, now I'm not feeling brilliant anymore. Applied brilliance? I mean, brilliance the applied kind? What, what does that mean exactly? Applied brilliance. There's abstract brilliance, and then there's applied brilliance. It's really kind of, it's kind of frightening. I mean, I, I don't know what uh, applied brilliance is all about, because it, you know, maybe it's, 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 it's an attempt to uh, brilliance, all your brilliance, raise your hands. <laughs> Apply here. Please come. All the brilliant people here come to the front. I mean. It, and, and, and then maybe it's trying to weed out the brilliant for some reason that maybe is a little bit frightening. I mean, brilliance now taking applications. I mean, maybe that's degrading to the whole idea of brilliance. You can't apply to be brilliant. Or maybe just maybe we want the brilliant people out of the institution entirely. And probably some of you designers know exactly what that's all about. Uh, brilliant need not apply, right? And that brings us to the recession, OK? <laughs> There is this tension, though, between the applied and the pure. And when I was a mathematician at the University of Chicago, there was this notion of applied math, and there was this notion of pure math. And pure math was far superior in righteousness to applied math. But, but consider this fellow here, Paul Dirac, Nobel Prize winner, one of the founders of uh, contemporary physics, came right after Einstein. <laughs> Paul Dirac is a Nobel Prize winner because something called projective geometry developed in the Renaissance, which allowed Canaletto to make images like this, allowed him to visualize the physics of antimatter and to create the equations, the pure mathematical equations of relativity that predicted the existence of all the particles that Einstein couldn't even have imagined. Applied mathematics, applied geometry, projective geometry, which is all about what draftsmen learn, uh, what, uh, uh, what, what designers learn, as a way of sketching out perspectives and to making three-dimensional objects in two-dimensional space and to understand how that works. Projective geometry, in this case, was the reason was, was the way, was the mechanism, was the visual window into the deep structure of matter for Paul Dirac. This is what I was invited to, okay, this week. Lloyd Blankfein, chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs. All right, and this gets to the issue of what uh, uh, Debbie was talking about. How did we get here uh, in, in terms of this economic situation? Lloyd Blankfein, who's the chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, has invited journalists like me, okay, <laughs> why? <laughs> you think I get a lot of calls from Lloyd Blankfein? At Goldman Sachs, John, you free? You free on Friday for breakfast? Yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. Fortune magazine has created this event for Lloyd Blankfein to come before a bunch of journalists like me and the people at Fortune, and God knows who else is going to be there, and talk about one thing. Does anybody know what Lloyd Blankfein has to talk about at breakfast this Friday? Does anyone have any idea? 
the fact that he's handing out $20 billion of bonuses to his employees. And he's a little bit worried that this might have a PR problem, create a PR problem for Goldman. What's Lloyd going to say? Is Lloyd going to say, I'm sorry, we have $20 billion in bonuses? I don't think he's going to say that, no. Uh, is Lloyd going to say, um, the reason we have $20 billion of bonuses is because I'm a genius, because I'm brilliant? No. No, I don't think he's going to say that. Um, but, but he might say something like, uh, like what uh, J.D. Rockefeller said many, many years ago when he was asked about, uh, actually, that's not J.D. Rockefeller. That's, uh, that's Andrew Mellon. But, I'll, but I actually, I've got, I've got both of them here, but let me, let me quote both of them first. Because it occurred to me, in times of prosperity, there are these huge, rich, gilded age leaders who become geniuses by virtue of their success. But here's Thomas Mellon, who left his fortune to Andrew Mellon, who was, by most estimates, at the time he was alive, the second, the second or third wealthiest human being ever to walk the earth. He basically created the modern banking system, Andrew Mellon did. But the fortune was made by his father, Thomas, who lived in the mid-1800s. And this is how he described his success. This is how he described his genius. He said he lived at a time when it was such a period as seldom occurs and hardly ever more than once in anyone's lifetime. The period between 1863 and 1873 was one in which it was easy to grow rich, there was a steady increase in the value of property and commodities and an active market all the time. One had only to buy anything and wait, buy anything and wait, to sell at a profit, sometimes, as in real estate, for instance, at a very large profit in a short time. That's how he explained his success. Brilliant. Applied brilliance. But, but you think that's good? This is even better. This is J.D. Rockefeller, who's actually money is responsible for this uh, uh, place that we're in a little bit, a little bit. When asked in the 1890s uh, why he was at age 31 the largest refiner of oil in the world, looking back many, many years later, he said, I believe the power to make money is a gift from God just as are the instincts for art, music, literature, the doctor's talent, the nurses, yours. I don't know if he was speaking of architects or designers. To be developed and used to the best of our ability for the good of mankind, having been endowed with the gift I possess, I believe it is my duty to make money and still more money and to use the money I make for the good of my fellow man according to the dictates of my conscience. Now, do you think Lloyd Blankfein will maybe allude to that? On Friday? No, I don't think so. And the reason I raise that is because the, the reason we got here, and the here that we got to is not something we should necessarily shy away from, not something that we should be sad about. Uh, do any of you know the first line of Anna Karenina? It's one of the most famous first lines of a novel which you may or may not think is a fabulous novel. But it, it, it basically says that all happy families are alike all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. And I think economically you can translate that line a little bit. All prosperities are alike. The blank finds, the Rockefellers, the Mellons, all sort of see a trend, they see a, a market force, and at the perfect timing that they happen to be alive, they ride it to the top and then look back on their lives and go, brilliant. I mean, Jack Welch, brilliant. I mean, he was head of General, Mo General Electric for about the same period of time, a decade, in which if you bought anything, <laughs> for instance, real estate, <laughs> it increased in value very quickly. All prosperities are alike. It's the downturns that are interesting. It's the downturns that sort of fracture humanity, intelligences, individuality into small pockets I mean, we're, we're taught to think that entrepreneurialism is all about the rise. It's all about Microsoft becoming the largest company in the world. No, that's long past the curve of entrepreneurialism. That's, that's the prosperity. That's the railroad age. That's the, 
that's the boring conformist period when you know Bill Gates and Larry Ellison you know are basically racing sailboats it's it's not it's not that period when what's next what's next do we know what's next we focus on the prosperities and I went to a lot of these design conferences during the prosperity of the 90s and and even after 9/11 when you know things continued to move forward and I, and I think you know the, the sense of wow designers are being asked to do things they never were asked to do before but they were being asked to do similar things everybody was involved in a startup uh, you know people were trying to decipher whether you know uh, refrigeratormagnets.com was was a significant difference in 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 insight and and capitalist brilliance than than sockpuppet.com you know there was a certain sense that we were all riding the same train to the top, but now, you know, we have to focus on much more subtle, individual, solitary forces. You know, many of you, I'm sure, and these books were a part of the rise. Has any, are you familiar with the book Freakonomics and the explosive sequel Super Freakonomics, which actually just hits bookstores next week? And, and of course, everybody knows Gladwell, right, the tipping point. And, and the long tail, Chris Anderson from Wired, his book. I mean, all of these books are about, hey, wow, beneath the market trends are these subtle things going on. Well, of course, you know, Gladwell stories are always told in hindsight. There was this tipping point, right? But, you know, I, I don't want to know there was this tipping point. <laughs> it's like, tomorrow there's going to be a tipping point. I'm interested in that. that. I would read that book, Tomorrow's Tipping Point, or hey, check these tipping points out that are coming next year kind of thing. No, no, no. It's, it's all understood in hindsight, and it basically says the same thing over and over again. Now, the stories are fascinating to read, but they delude us into thinking that somehow we can imagine, we can predict the tipping point when it's fundamentally unpredictable. Market forces conceal what's really interesting about both the economy and the, and the sort of market of intellectual capitalism that's changing the world, that's causing all of those statistics that you see up there. We, we focus on scaling up and replication, when in fact, the moment that, that is so fantastic is the one which presents us with an event and a thought that we're having for the very first time. This little girl is my eight-year-old daughter, Regan. And uh, I'm uh, married to my wife for 13 years. She's, she's back there uh, at the table. She's a fabulous person, and she's a saint for tolerating me, quite frankly. Um, but, uh, but, but I was married before, back in the 1970s, to a woman by the name of Chris. And, and I wrote about it in my book, but I never had told my children this story. And, and finally, when my daughters turned 11, my oldest daughters turned 11, I mentioned to one of them that, yes, daddy had been married before. And no kids. And, uh, you know, I'm not in touch with my ex-wife. And, and, you know, it's a period, it, it, it was a fine thing. It, it didn't work out. And it, there's no connection between then and now. <laughs> right. Right. Last week, Regan comes to me and says, Daddy, is this Chris Todd, your wife? And I said, where did you get that? I Googled you. <laughs> and I Googled Chris Todd. And I Googled John Hockenberry and Chris Todd. And she showed me all of the Googling she'd been doing to find out the closest she came to my ex-wife was the shrimp boat she owns in Alaska. And <laughs> And because only I know that she owns a shrimp boat in Alaska, I was able to say, well, none of these pictures relate at all, really. But, but the idea that your children Google you <laughs> and Google you to find out that you were married before. I mean, she, could she Google me and find out that I was arrested for drunken disorderly at age 16? Maybe. And I have four kids. This is just the eight-year-old, OK? And, and it's not the first time. I wrote a book, a novel called The River Out of Eden, in which I use the name of my ex-brother-in-law, a guy by the name of Duke McCurdy, who, you know, was a 
lovely fellow, he was my ex-brother-in-law, I just loved his name, and I made the, as it turned out, the mistake of using his name in a book that was a novel about uh, a, a crazy racist in the Pacific Northwest, and, and his name was Duke, and his dad's name was Roy. And he, Duke's son Googles his dad, discovers my book, and Duke, for some reason, I, never, I haven't had any conversations with him about this, uh, apparently looks at this, is so outraged that he hires a lawyer who sues me and Random House for defamation of character, and we settle out of court, uh, Random House does, for like 50K, because they don't, they're too terrified to take this to a jury. As though I, in this novel, was calling Duke McCurdy a racist, and the idea was that the son, by Googling his dad and finding this as the first file that comes up, was so upset, was so freaked out that there needed to be some damages. As I said to my lawyer when he announced the settlement, I said, well, um, and this actually is defamation of character, um, the, the, <laughs> the, the price of Redbud in one county in Wisconsin probably went up the weekend that that settlement was paid. Um, which is about the only real consequence I can see, but. But what it's all about is a shifting of context. I take the name out of context, put it in a book. The son Googles the dad, finds the name, takes the book name out of context, turns it into a completely different narrative of pain and suffering to his family that results in a payment of $50,000. These are the events it seems to me, the surprising, crazy, context-shifting events of children Googling their parents that really talks about the place where brilliance lives, not in the trend, not in stock market moving up or, you know, 2% growth or the kinds of trend lines that we talk about so confidently in our society and in our government. So, so to, to conclude, I, I'd like to really focus on what, what this is about, what this event is about, this, this notion of focusing not on the trend, not on what the market forces uh, 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 you know, encourage us to look at, where things are going, I'm going to ride that, you know, where things are headed, I'm going to get on board, find the ground floor, yeah, Rem Coolhouse goes to Dubai, whoa, that's daring, yeah. Wow, takes a lot of guts to go to Dubai or, or Beijing and create some spectacle building, you know. And, and, and these are great artists, but the brilliance isn't there. The, you know, paying the bills and putting the deck on the house is there, but not the brilliance, and certainly not the applied brilliance. So, right, here's some poet. I mean, I read, I read the words of some poet, okay? But heard, half heard. <laughs> what do you think? Is that any good? Is, is that good poetry? But heard, half heard. Yeah, I'm not getting much of a response out of you. <laughs> but what about this, okay? T.S. Eliot, monster famous poet, right? This is T.S. Eliot at 19. Nobody knew this guy. It was just some sort of Nigel from Britain, right? You know, someone with a, a great education, okay, writing poetry. But there, you got T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot wrote these words, but heard, half heard. Now what do you think? The question really is, how many words do I have to read of T.S. Eliot poetry before you have the experience of T.S. Eliot's brilliance? Six, you think? But heard, half heard, in. But heard, half heard, in the. How about the end of all? The point is every poem had a moment where it was heard for the first time. Where it was not only heard for the first time, but heard without the baggage of the reputation of the author. There was always a moment when these words 
came from someone as random looking as this and had to produce their brilliance and prove their brilliance purely on the syllables alone. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Though the unknown remembered gate when the last of the earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, as the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between two waves of the sea, Quick now, here, now, always, a condition of complete simplicity, costing not less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are enfolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one. Now, we can feel the brilliance of T.S. Eliot, but we cannot feel the original brilliance of the first time that poem was understood. And that is the moment of all art, of all brilliance, of all genius, that is not about trend, that is not about scalability, that is not about getting in on the ground floor. Every piece of art, every piece of inspiration had that moment of existence, of coming into existence. The world before the four quartets was a different world than the world after the four quartets. The world before Hamlet, different than the world after. The world before Frank Lloyd Wright, the world different after. And same with every one of your inspirations. The same with every moment that might possibly contend to be brilliant or applied brilliant. A moment of balance, of pitch, between here and there, between then and now, Yes, it is those things that we should look for. And these are my four children. And yes, they're beautiful, and yes, they're sweet. But yes, you should imagine all four of those individuals Googling me incessantly. <laughs> How I respond to that, the unpredictability of that, is brilliant. Have a great conference. Thank you.